<clears throat> Thanks, Pia. It looks like my sound is getting through all right. The, uh, Pia, could you give me a thumbs up? I'm not sure anyone at, in Toronto is out. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, Pia, that was really interesting as always to listen to you at length without interrupting you. <laughs> the, um, the real strength, I think, in what you were talking about is clear in where you imagine the operationalization of... Um, of uh, these sorts of ideals and, and, and things like that. I also work in, um, I suppose, the operational end of these ideals, but in a smaller sector, the education sector. And for, well, for at least 10 years, the um, broader ideas that Pia talks about have been um, championed by some people in education on the notion of open education and uh, not just in terms of open, in terms of free access to media, which is unfortunately the way most people in education interpret it, but it also means transparency. And um, But I'll just turn on, I've got some slides to lean on here so that uh, not everyone needs to look at the poor lighting in my house. Let me just share them over to the screen. And uh, just have a double check to see that you're seeing those. Okay, thanks, Pia. So I won't be looking at the video conference um, for a while now because uh, I'm just looking at my slides. So where, so in the 10 years, and that's a short time, I suppose, to be working in the education sector, but championing, championing the um, open education ideas and openness generally, um, I came to realize, I suppose, by having regular contact with uh, intellectuals who are quite a lot more experienced than I am, that um, I became self-conscious that technology was driving all of the imaginations or most of the imaginations in terms of open education. And it was, um, and I reflected on, on that and in the times before me in education and during my time in 10 years of education, I could observe some pretty um, interesting phenomena. One was that uh, in the 80s and particularly in the 90s and then less so in the um, two th early 2000s, there was an incredibly heavy investment in computer-mediated and online learning, yet without any evidence that would it, pr it, it would provide improvements. And I'm not really one to say that everything, every um, investment and every innovation needs evidence before we do it. But in terms of the volume of money and resources put into something, um, it, it's a little bit concerning to look back and to think literally billions of dollars invested in something, but in an imagining that was still linked to a prior time. So um, millions of dollars put into creating online textbooks with um, some, some small multimedia um, um, features. Linked to that then was also some questionable directions and they were questioned at the time. So there was learning object theory um, that was connected to um, object programming uh, where resources and media and stuff were contained and then uh, designed to be shared around different platforms that are now more or less redundant. Um, even bigger than that was a silent change in the education sector uh, that is come to be called academic capitalism. And I think most, most of us would intuitively understand what that means. User pay systems, um, the idea of free education and public education as a public good is severely eroded by such a thing. And uh, education responding to market demands. And so we no longer have strong humanities and social science and um, other, and history and things like that. And then educational inflation. So that's, right across the board for the cost of it. Uh, textbooks, the textbook where textbooks still remain, where publishers have entered into that um, uh, um, online resources stuff and, uh, and we haven't seen the cost of their resources come down so much. Um, moreover, the cost of getting an education is inflated quite a bit and then also the need for an education in most professions is also inflated. Um, and then thirdly, linking probably to the first one is a, I observe a sidelining of where the clear evidence for improvements in learning are. And um, 
uh, tools like uh, the Google search, um, tools like and phenomenon like the Wikipedia uh, project and all the related projects to that and like projects, so crowdsourcing the um, production of uh, reference text that's uh, absent any, any um, copyright restrictions and absent any, um, any commercial interests. And then uh, similar but different to Wikipedia is the YouTube phenomenon of people who may or may not be um, uh, qualified to give instruction on certain things, but yet they, just through generosity and interest, they share their knowledge on something and um, then YouTube becomes a phenomenon of people teaching people um, any number of things. You can pretty much learn anything you need to know on YouTube. Um, and and so and, and then also the free university movement, which has been around since the seventies at least, um, but then has had a reemergence, um, a resurgence uh, in the internet days. But what I've observed in the education sector is a, is an absolute sidelining of those phenomena, and and that those things don't feature in conversation you know, in any deep level in the education sector that I've experienced anyway. So through talking to those intellectuals uh, with what far more knowledge and experience than I have, uh, I, I discovered a term which is fairly commonly known, posted uh, by Neil Postman of Technopoly. And um, <clears throat> reflecting on that book and related texts, I came to decide that in the education sector, at least, our ideas and actions are determined by the technology and lack a link to um, the, the, the longer past. In fact, uh, it's a feature of our Western culture, I think, to more or less destroy the past to rebuild our future and uh, in a form of futurism. So in the education sector, it's a common throwaway line that the, edu the, the lecture format is dead, that we've got to replace it with something else and all that we see is recorded lectures going online. Um, and yet the lecture format has been around for quite some time. And I was reflecting on listening to Pia. Normally Pia and I, when we're in a space together, we're talking with each other. And so we're interrupting and responding to each other, but it was, I really appreciated hearing Pia talk at length about her ideas, even though it was very early in the morning for her as it is for me. Um, and not, not having that chance to interrupt her and have, and having the, um, her, allowing her to have the space to really, um, lay out her idea uh, <clears throat> the in the on the internet I suppose that sort of luxury is uh, well it's it's diminishing I suppose that's everything's coming down to four minute chunks but in the education sector where technology is determining ideas and by that I mean recent technology and tangible technologies like computers and internets um, I see a trend of people disparaging or rejecting the past to rebuild their ideas for the for, for today and in the future and I think it's an unfortunate phenomenon because we lose contact with those intellectuals who their ideas are absolutely parallel to the new the so-called new ideas they're just not realized in the technology and that may be a benefit um, and then also in the managerial spaces of education at least an incapacity to consider the consequences of their actions so I've seen no consideration much in the managerial sector of education on the consequences of academic capitalism, which is determined by a broader sense of the word technology. So what I'm asking, what I'm thinking is could, well, just as a challenge to myself, I want to see if I can imagine uh, a range of principles, uh, an, eth an ethical framework, I suppose, that would guide conversations about technology, hopefully guide te uh, conversations about technology, certainly would guide my personal um, considerations about the technology. And, uh, but in saying that, um, I do subscribe to the rather cynical view that the road to hell is paved by good intentions. There really is, a, you know, it's uh, basically a feature of humanity that um, we've all tried to improve things uh, but through that trying, some unintended consequences that we didn't reflect on led to some hellish consequences. And just out of interest, that's a, um, an original document from the Bilderberg Group um, in their form, in initial formation of the Club of Rome. And in the text, you can read good intentions of their time, but with the benefits of today, we can look back and see the triggers to the unintended consequences 
of their global perspective and their global ideas and their way of practice being behind closed doors with elite and um, expert groups. Okay, so in a parallel life to education, I've got an interest in permaculture. Uh, subsistence farming, I suppose, but mimicking ecology, uh, where you might plant gardens and trees and in ways that harness the energy flows on the land, but basically trying to build a self-sufficient, self-regulating garden that needs very little input. Um, and that's a concept that's been... Well, it's born from Australia, permaculture at least, and uh, over the years, since the uh, mid-70s, uh, one of the proponents, or one of the inventors, I suppose, of the concept, David Holgram, he devised a set of ethics principles, ethics and principles that would help imagine permaculture design. And I think thanks to that work, that has what that has been what has made permaculture design scale across the world. And if you've never looked at it, you just put in permaculture in YouTube or Google search, and you'll just see how far that concept has reached and uh, what the impact it's, it's having. And yet it's not commonly taught in any formal education sense in universities or colleges. Uh, they've set up their own research institute, the Permaculture Research Institute, that has offices in numerous countries. But what I'm focusing on really is that um, simplistic layout of ethics principles, ethics and principles. And um, David Holgram and the permaculture movement presented in this feedback loop where in the center there are three ethics. They agree on three ethics. Uh, what are they? They're um, uh, share, the, share the yield. Uh, oh. It's too early in the morning. I've forgotten them, and that's pretty pretty lame. But I do know them quite well. And there are twelve principles around them, and one of them is, um, for example, produce no waste. And and what those principles do is they inform um, people's methods. So that they design any number of methods, infinite number of methods. And what the outcome of that method is, or the consequence of that method, is checked and measured against the principles. So the principles have to be measurable. The ethics are a value or a virtue statement, but the principles are somewhat measurable from those principles, a combination of those principles, produce a method or an idea for action, and then the consequences of action, those actions are constantly checked against the principles. It seems obvious, but this sort of framework is certainly lacking in the education sector as we roll out iPad education trials with really no reflection on um, or even anticipation on some of the con social consequences of such a trial, etc. So I've looked at um, a fairly limited range of readings. I'm sure if I kept on reading and, in fact, devoted myself full time to uh, this sort of theoretical thinking, I'd never be satisfied with where I'm arriving at. So I've read uh, uh, almost all the works of Ivan Illich, um, some of the works of Neil Postman, Christopher Alexander and, and, and co, who wrote the uh, pattern language. Um, uh, Antien Banger and um, Antien Banger's work on communities of practice and situated learning, and uh, and a few others, and I've quoted from them or drawn out of their work a framework of ethics and principles that is very much still a work in progress, and I guess I'm using it to guide my work as I try to operationalize the ideas of open education in the universities I work at. So at the moment, the three guiding ethics are uh, living with dignity and justice, open, open and accessible, relevant and meaningful. Now, as I said, they're, they're kind of virtue or value statements that are not very measurable. They're woolly. But when we get to the principles, it's trying to get statements of principles down to something that can hold uh, methods and outcomes to account. And I don't think this list of 12, I think it's 12 or 11 things here, does that, but it's on its way to it. Uh, this is still a work in progress for me anyway, and it's a personal work to try and guide some of my work and link it to some historical ideas and theories. Um, so I won't go through them all, but I just want to say that those three there come from Illich, from Tools, of, Tools for Conviviality, uh, it's 1973, and um, the Schooling Society as well, as a number of other of his works. Uh, then Leif and Wenger from their... Um, uh, situated learning, legitimate peripheral participation, 
fascinating text based on their research looking at um, informal learning uh, and how that happens in, in, in professions like midwifery and things like that. Um, more Leib and Wenger. Uh, and then also I've tried to adapt Richard Storman's work uh, who's mainly informed the free software movement uh, and it's difficult to adapt into things other than software but I think it's fair to say that those sorts of principles that Storman talks about free software and open access etc uh, have informed the ideals of generally the movement of openness um, even though he may have polarized it somewhat with his way of presenting it's still in compelling arguments and I'm interested to see, to see in myself if I can adapt what Storman says into at least open education practices. I'm not the only one trying to do that, of course. And then Alexandra et al. Uh, with um, their pattern language uh, describing the ways physical spaces from um, to whole, whole cities, villages and towns uh, to um, individual homes may be designed to um, induce all, all range of things, and including... Uh, a network of learning is what they considered uh, a good education space rather than a centralised space of schools and institutions. Okay, so some examples out of those methods, and by the way, I'm only a few minutes from finishing these slides, so we, everyone may appreciate we'll get out of here early. I know it's quite late in Toronto. Um, is uh, I've looked at well, well, an example of methods that we may hold to account to those principles that are work in progress. There's a theatre group here in Melbourne called One Step at a Time, and one of their productions is called En Route. And I cite this as an example of situated learning, even though it's a theoretic, th theatrical experience. There's no theatre. There's no um, central space that people go to. They um, enlist in the experience... I think it's by sending a text message to a phone number. They get a text message back, giving them instructions to go to some space, like it might be a public train station or something like that. And when they get to that space, there's no further instructions, but one of the performers in the theatre group may perform something in street theatre sense in front of them. At the end of that experience, they'll get an instruction. It may be a very explicit instruction or it may be something left to their... their um, own imaginings of what to do, but it's to usually to go to another space or to ring this phone number or to look at that, look in that direction. And it, it goes for an afternoon, I think, and people move around the space of Melbourne, experiencing Melbourne as a theoretical street performance. So this is the art movement of situationism, but, um, but brought forward to this day and age. And I like to take that approach to theatre and, and imagine it in an education sense, in San Diego, there's a group called, uh, called Agit Prop, and they established the University 2837. I'm not sure what 2837 stands for, but what they did is they held um, in a they obtained access to a, um, a venue that could facilitate, uh, hold a, a lecture, and they ran a series of lectures looking at the ideas of Illich and many others, uh, th these sorts of ideas, I suppose I'm talking about, and then asked them to go out into San Diego and record, find venues that, um, or places or phenomenon that align to those ideas of networked, open, participatory education and learning and so, and so forth, and um, basically geotag them and, and uh, bring them back with some sort of statement supporting why they chose that. So it's a kind of similar to the um, Situationist Theatre Group where you're giving people except it's different where you're giving people some preformed ideas and then asking them to go out into their space and relate to their space with those ideas that we assume are new for them. Other methods that are, um, there's plenty online, schooloveverything.org, I think, is a, just a space where uh, anyone who wants to teach something can register their interest in teaching that something and anyone who wants to learn something can go through those listed things and choose to join into courses and some of those are paid for courses learning how to play guitar or whatever peer-to-peer -peer university or P2PU um, P uh, similar framework uh, they're engaged um, badging as a way of accreditation transition universities and not to mention transition towns um, 
the Melbourne Free University as um, and the San Francisco Free University as a resurgence of the Free Free University International movement, although the link is not direct historically, which is, as I said, a feature of a lot of our new imaginings based on technology. We seem to have lost the link to even recent history. And then so on. So there's a range of um, projects that have some level of popularity um, based on these principles. And then in my own work, I try to document as I move around different universities and texts, I try to keep a wiki book up to date called um, um, Open Education Practices, a user guide for organizations. So ultimately, I'm interested in trying to devise a personal um, set of principles uh, that I would operate by and then see if I can translate them, them into an organizational sense and um, offer whatever I can to helping organizations adapt to what I think is, um, is uh, an appropriate way for them to organize in relation to people these days or, or in the future, near future. As I said, this is a work in progress. Uh, you can go to Wikiversity and search for ethical framework for ubiquitous learning and you'll find the notes on this work's progress. It's been going for a little too long, uh, I admit, but um, at least I'm, I'm documenting each iteration, including this presentation and sub uh, submissions of an essay that goes with it to various journals or, and, and the like. It's all on that wiki. Uh, thanks very much for staying back, uh, those who are left in Toronto, if anyone. And uh, also thanks, Pia, for hosting this, um, this hangout. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing the recording and um, take notes and help improve my work from it.